Welcome. I'm delighted to welcome you all here today for this seminar asking, does the liberal international order have a future? With our guest today, Professor John Eikenberry. My name is Ben Tonra, and I'm Professor of International Relations at the School of Politics and International Relations here at University College Dublin. Just a couple of housekeeping details to note before we kick off. Uh, please note the event is being recorded and is on the record. Professor Eikenberry will speak for about 20 minutes, and the remainder of the hour will be devoted to our discussion based on your comments and questions, which you can submit at any time through the Q&A function on Zoom. Please just don't forget to identify yourself and your professional affiliation when you submit your question or comment. You're also most welcome to share our conversation on social media using the at IIEA handle. Uh, it is a real pleasure and honor for me today uh, to, uh, to welcome and introduce Professor Eikenberry. He is the Albert G. Milbank Professor of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton University and is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He is the author of eight books, most recently, A World Safe for Democracy, Liberal Internationalism in the Making of the Modern World, Order, sorry, which was uh, published in 2020 by Yale University Press. This was a book which was deservedly judged as best of the year by the Foreign Policy Magazine. In that text, he's asked some tough questions about the relationship between global order, democracy, and unfettered economic globalization, and their potential reconciliation. And a couple of those themes I hope he hits on today. John is a re world-renowned theorist of international relations and perhaps the theorist on the nature and future of the liberal order. He's also that rare breed of scholar who moves seamlessly between advanced scholarship and public policy. His public policy service is extensive, having worked at the State Department's policy planning staff and at a number of the US's leading think tanks from the Carnegie Endowment, the Woodrow Wilson Center, the Brookings Institute, and now currently with the Council on Foreign Relations. John, you are very welcome to our virtual IIEA in Dublin. We're really looking forward to your contribution. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ben, and to the IIEA. Just uh, thank you so much for hosting me. It's a real pleasure to, to be here, here being virtual, uh, un unfortunately, but uh, 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 saving uh, in-person meeting for another time. It's it's at least great to see, uh, see you on the screen and to have this chance to talk about world order, uh, liberal, uh, the liberal world order and uh, its future. Um, let me uh, start really by uh, the observation that many of us share that, that the world itself is um, in transition, that the, the old order that we've, we've seen over the last 75 years uh, uh, clearly is uh, under stress, breaking down in crisis, different ways of looking at it. Uh, more broadly across the world in the shadow of the pandemic uh, and the shadow of global warming, there seems to be a, a more general lost uh, confidence in collective solutions to collective problems, the, the multilateral mindset, the, the liberal international, internationalist mindset seems to, to be uh, 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 on the, its back heels, uh, a sense that we aren't really performing at the level that we were in earlier eras. Uh, and there's a sense of a kind of world historical moment uh, not least by what's happened in the last uh, year, uh, the, 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 the growing uh, antagonism with great powers that are, are clearly illiberal, that do not wish the Western-oriented, liberal-oriented uh, order well, Russia uh, and uh, China to, to, to start, uh, but Iran and, and North Korea is making itself known again. So there's a kind of encirclement of this troubled order basic questions are being asked as I try to pursue in my new book about what are the sources of order? Uh, can liberal democracy make a comeback? Uh, can capitalism and democracy be brought back into balance in the context of inequality and dysfunction and dislocation? And what is the future of liberal internationalism as a, as a, as a, a mode of organizing the world, a cooperative organization of the global system? Uh, and so, that, that really is the, the set of questions that we're, we're debating today. In my, in my work, uh, this recent work, I've, I've tried to take the long view to kind of go back and try to put moment to moment the TikTok of today in, in broader historical context. And in doing so, uh, drawing the observation that the, the liberal international order it did not begin in 1989, nor really in 1945. Uh, it's been a longer struggle by, by liberal democratic states and uh, partners over 
at least 200 years to, to work towards building a, a global order that would be congenial for, for these emerging uh, polities, liberal, liberal democracies. There have been extraordinary moments of, 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 of uh, good times and bad times, golden eras and crises, uh, uh, close run things. Uh, think of the 1930s. And in many ways, if you look over the longer period, 1989 and the 90s, the, the unipolar liberal moment, uh, looks more anomalous, that the longer period is one of, of great contestation, a kind of uh, agonistic um, uh, a story uh, of challenge, of conflict, um, of adaptation. Uh, think about the 1930s and 40s, which I have gone back to in my current uh, uh, focus. Uh, the, the last time there was this great disruption, disruption or dis, dis, disjuncture in the global system. Uh, uh, in the in the sense that uh, liberal democracy as a way of life was 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 really at a kind of extinction moment. Think about the generation of 1945. In their own uh, professional lifetimes, they were uh, trying to make sense of a world that had just seen the Great Depression, the rise of total war, the rise of fascism, the rise of totalitarianism, the Holocaust and the dropping of the atomic bomb, all within a, a very small part of world history. And yet, and yet that generation of liberals, uh, Ira Katz Nelson's brilliant book, uh, Desolation and Enlightenment, uh, tells the story of this generation of policy liberals who, who wanted to rebuild open societies. Uh, th that was their, their task and in, indeed they did it. And so we can, take some uh, lesson drawing from that period, a usable past from the way liberal democracies have struggled in the past and found solutions. My, my book uh, really tries to do a number of different things that I want to talk about uh, very briefly uh, uh, in the next while. Um, first of all, to, to try to convince you uh, that there is something called liberal internationalism as a way of thinking about the world, uh, ideas and, and projects and a history. Secondly, to, to be honest about its successes and failures, it has been a mixed record uh, uh, for certain, and there's a lot of criticism that's well-deserved. Uh, and then thirdly, to try to chart a path to how can we go forward? And there, I'll end my remarks really saying a few words about the Biden administration, which in many ways is the embodiment of what a, a, an earnest, well-meaning American administration that, that wishes the liberal order well, what it's doing, so we can draw some di diagnostic conclusions from how it's going. But what is liberal internationalism? Well, the first move in my book really is to try to reorient what that means. Uh, uh, the, the most famous phrase to embody that, uh, that idea is, is Wilson's, Woodrow Wilson's, uh, A World Safe for Democracy. And it's typically meant, and it's been passed down as a, as a kind of um, slogan uh, that entails a, a, a prog program of, of spreading democracy worldwide. And what I argue in my book is that's not the best reading, that in fact, you can read that phrase literally as to make the world safe for liberal democracy to survive. So safety is the, is the key word, to create a kind of environment, a, an ecosystem uh, a geopolitical setting for liberal democracies to, to do things, to survive. And, and that is my major intellectual contribution, I, I think, uh, to, to think about the, the global order as not the global order as a whole, but as a, at least a subset of, of that order, which is a kind of ecosystem in which liberal democracies and, and various kinds of hybrid regimes are working to create uh, rules and institutions to manage their mutual vulnerabilities. Liberal democracies are incredibly co complicated, uh, uh, in some sense designed to misfunction. Uh, uh, think about liberal democracies as, as uh, being built around principles that are inconsistent. Liberty and equality, um, individualism and community, uh, uh, sovereignty and interdependence. It's 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 a it's it, the, the 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 flaws are built into the the system and indeed celebrated because we we want we want multiple things that are in some sense intention and part of the liberal order is creating an environment an ecosystem where 
uh, these polities can, can get, engage in that never ending balancing and trade off exercise and to aggregate their power for uh, dealing with larger environmental crises, geopolitical and otherwise in their, their periphery. So I try to recast liberal internationalism as a pragmatic, opportunistic, problem solving tradition, um, and, uh, and then think more uh, specifically about what this means. And let me just say that the next point I wanna make is really that uh, I acknowledge the, the difficult times that those of us who, who fly the banner of liberal internationalism, who think this is, there's something here that shouldn't be, shouldn't be uh, ignored, um, uh, there's a, a sense that, that there has been a troubled recent period. And I, I would identify three uh, uh, moments or, or, or uh, events, you might say, that, that have uh, uh, put liberal internationalism on the defensive, uh, uh, raised questions about its, its viability. Uh, one is the Iraq war, which uh, in many ways was uh, uh, a war that came out of uh, liberal unipolar America. Uh, and, and so uh, the, the failure of that war uh, uh, in many ways discredited uh, at least part of the internationalist elites in, in, in Washington, uh, uh, certainly on the, 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 the Republican side. The, the 2008 financial crisis in many ways did the same for uh, internationalist elites on the Democratic side, uh, uh, a kind of twin crises that, that's, that weakened the ability of our leaders to stand up and say, we should think of our national interest in global and internationalist terms. And then the, the liberal bet on China that we could use liberal strategies of inclusion, incorporation, inviting and indeed welcoming China into the liberal order. And, and by doing so, we would, we would uh, uh, see China make this transition. It didn't happen. And so we have uh, before us uh, a mixed record. I, I spend a lot of time uh, trying to say, okay, uh, what has worked? Uh, what has been the record? Is there something here that we should we should um, uh, learn from and preserve? And I think there is. We, I think that the liberal order uh, has been a, a, a great world historical success, uh, creating over decades with states across the Atlantic and then even further afield across the Pacific, around the world, uh, creating a kind of coalitional order a kind of platform with lots of layers, lots of institutions, economic, security, political, uh, environmental, uh, and creating uh, uh, capacities for problem solving through integration and, and various kinds of collaboration. I have my big six, the six great accomplishments of the liberal order, uh, uh, the reopening the world economy after World War II, creating a framework for Germany and, and Japan to to reorient their great power status as civilian great powers. Even today, Germany is different uh, than the other traditional great powers, and so too Japan. That's good in many respects. Uh, and it's only possible because of this framework that I've been describing. Germany and France were able to overcome their historic differences and starting with the, 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 the coal and steel community and, and create a foundation for the launching of the European Union. Trilateral cooperation took root uh, during and after the Cold War, the so-called G7 countries. And fifth, the, uh, uh, the, the platform that I've been describing, creating a kind of welcome home for uh, states that are making transitions. Uh, think of uh, South Korea, think of other countries in East Asia, in East, Eastern Europe, Central Europe, uh, Latin America, Southern Europe, countries that have, over the course of the 80s and 90s, the number of democracies doubled, and they found a, a docking station. They found a place to go where they could get assistance, security, economic, and so forth. And then finally, um, China has had its best decades in two millennia uh, under the auspices of what we used to call Pax Americana. So even China, uh, uh, in ways we may want to describe, has seen this as, as a framework that has lifted boats and created opportunity. So what went wrong? So very quickly moving to the, the next kind of looking at the critique and then what happens uh, going forward. My own view is that it's a kind of uh, a failure of success or problems of success. Uh, during the Cold War, we often forget that the liberal order 
uh, the, the free world, as it used to be called, was really a world, a, a, a subset, a kind of club of countries that uh, were inside of a bipolar order. And that or ordering, uh, larger ordering environment created incentives and capacities within the, 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 this coalition of states to do things. Uh, it, it was kind of a mutual aid society. Uh, it created uh, opportunities, uh, capacities, uh, intergovernmental relations to manage interdependence, obviously security for sure through the alliance system. Uh, and so there was this kind of club, club character to liberal order. Uh, countries knew uh, who was in and who was out and what it meant to be in and how to get in. After the Cold War ended, that club started to break down. And uh, as I argue in the later part of my book, uh, uh, the, the, the liberal order became more like a shopping mall where you could wander in and go to the Apple store or what have you and, and do very specific things, get things from the, the complex of, of institutions, but not buy into what I would call a suite of, of rights and responsibilities. And, and China, of course, is, is an example of this where, and this is my international relations theory uh, uh, point for the day. Uh, I, I've, been, I've been fairly light on, on theory. Uh, the logic of conditionality, the logic of conditionality, I think is something that we have to reckon with as a feature that was part of the success of the liberal order. And that logic of conditionality has, has, has broken down as countries can kind of come and go, uh, 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 pick and choose a, a buffet of possibilities uh, and so there isn't a kind of disciplining uh, 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 logic uh, at, at work today. So just to kind of move towards uh, what next, I, I think what the burden of my argument is that, um, that we need to, if the liberal order, um, as I've defined it, is to survive and re reinvent itself for the next era, it will, some sort of club-like quality is going to have to be rebuilt. And of course, this is why I'm, I'm actually quite bullish and happy to see Biden uh, talking about uh, democracies, uh, thinking about the world in part as, a, as, 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 as organized around a, a coalition uh, of, of liberal democracies that drive the reform uh, agenda. Uh, uh, not anything blockish like the Cold War, but um, but uh, the ability of countries to work together, the, 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 the future of world order, and this will be my most sweeping statement today, will be defined by which group of states can build coalitions, partnerships, alignments, groupings that have a certain robustness to them and that can move, move things, uh, if not mountains, at least move uh, move uh, 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 movements and politics in directions they want to go. Now, uh, I think it has to be at least a two-level game. You have to work to build uh, um, uh, relations with like-minded states while you sim simultaneously reach out to, to other states, including uh, Russia and China. This is not a, a narrow zero-sum world. It's a mixed-sum world with lots of, of, of fraught relations and things that have to be done together, even if we don't agree on, on values and so forth. So let me just end by talking a little bit about, about the, the first year of the Biden administration. It's been a, a, a very challenging year, partly by, uh, because of uh, missteps, uh, but, but larger reasons as well. Uh, Russia poised for a, a military intervention in Ukraine contesting the security order in Europe, Iran breaking out of, of a nuclear deal that the United States uh, unfortunately walked away from, very, very bad mistake on America's part, China grow, growing aggressiveness, uh, uh, in, uh, intimidating Taiwan, cracking down on democracy in, in Hong Kong, the Uyghurs in the West. It's, it's not a, it's not a, a liberal story, uh, and it's one that we have to worry about. Uh, as the, the potential, potentially the largest economy in the world. Uh, uh, North Korea, of course, is not going away either. So there ha the inbox, you might say, is full and getting full, fuller. And, uh, and, and indeed, as some say, the inbox may be on fire. 
I do think that Biden has has the the instincts uh, that uh, are constructive from both an American and a global perspective, uh, returning to the Paris Accords, uh, rejoining the WHO, putting arms control back on the agenda. The U.S. Uh, disastrously, I think, has walked away from from uh, uh, from arms control, Cold War era arms control that that really provided a kind of architecture of restraint. Um, the Afghan withdrawal was a was clearly a mistake, or or at least the methodology of of withdrawal was a mistake. But I would say that the there is uh, the good news is there really is a, a vision here. I do think that that Biden uh, has a at least a game game plan, if not a grand strategy, um, and I think uh, it's a, a threefold uh, threefold uh, uh, game plan. Uh, one is to rebuild the the political capital of the United States, uh, uh, creating partnerships and capacities to deal with global problems. In some sense, capacity building, creating social capacity, come what may. In other words, it's the creating partnerships and working relations re without regard to what the specific problems are, just reweaving the, the, the relationships so that we can put ourselves on a firmer footing to deal with whatever comes down the road. Uh, diplomacy. Uh, 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 um, George Schultz, one of my favorite American secretaries of state, who I uh, use a Princetonian undergraduate, uh, and I, I, I met him uh, several times back when he was at Stanford uh, in his last years. He, he talked about diplomacy as gardening, and others have done that as well. That metaphor is, is widely used. Uh, Biden is a gardener, I think, uh, uh, not always adroit, but I think uh, Tony Blinken feels it even more so. He, he was, uh, during the Obama years, uh, 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 deeply involved in creating partnerships on, uh, uh, on Afghanistan and other uh, thorny issues. Uh, so building uh, a Rolodex and, and meeting, um, uh, uh, it's not surprising that Biden in his UN speech in early October mentioned the term partnership 16 times and alliance uh, eight times. So that's the, the language, I think, uh, and it reflects a strategy of, 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 of building uh, this, uh, this, this coalition. Secondly, I think there's a deeply felt, felt sense that liberal democracy really is in trouble, that, and not least in the United States, that we could see uh, a, a real retrogression that we've already seen a, a preview of happen again, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, Trump restoration, or, or, or something that would lead to, to an even more kind of dysfunctional and uh, quasi-authoritarian system. I think there's a, a great deal of worry and a sense that we've got to show that democracy works before uh, the, the, the opposite forces gather their, that regather their strength. So democracy is, is integral to the success of the international order. Uh, in that sense, we really are like the period of FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, when uh, everything was tied together the struggle against uh, what FDR called the gangster regimes uh, uh, that were uh, at war uh, in the 40s uh, was in part uh, uh, to bring uh, like-minded states together to secure our own uh, beloved uh, institutions that we feel deeply, deeply passionate about, open societies with the rights and freedoms that I don't know how we get to the end of the 21st century if, if there isn't some modicum of those kind of constitutional rights and protections uh, of open uh, information, free, free association. Uh, so that's number two. And then finally, there is a kind of focus on China. Uh, 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 whether you call it a hawkish policy towards China, it is a, a policy of, of, of strategic competition, uh, uh, seeing uh, uh, China as a strategic rival uh, or what, what some would call, and indeed some Europeans have been calling a systemic rival, because it's not just a military competition. Indeed, it's not primarily a, a military competition. It's a comprehensive uh, uh, competition of ideas uh, of, of what, what, what I would call modernity projects. Um, uh, 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 certainly uh, um, uh, also a, a competition for, for technology supremacy, whether 
our regimes and institutions will be friendly to liberal democracy or friendly to autocracy and the CCP. Uh, multilateralism and institutions are not value neutral. They're not value neutral. So it, there is a struggle over, it doesn't sound as heroic as World War II, but it's a struggle over principles and rules for uh, next generation technology for, for these sorts of issues. And it matters if you have coalition partners, because it matters if you have critical mass, if you have platforms, if you're a first mover, if you can establish network uh, uh, externalities that create advantages. Uh, so this is the world we're in. And I think it's ironically uh, good for the liberal democracies to see that there is something else out there that could replace them. Uh, it's a kind of sobering moment. Uh, so uh, in an ironic way, China is doing a favor to the liberal democracies by, by uh, articulating a, a different path uh, that uh, while um, uh, the contest goes on, we can clarify our own choices in that context. So I, I don't think we're 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 at inevitable. It's inevitable that uh, that we will uh, re-enter re a cold war, but I do because I think we're so much more interdependent than the U.S. and the Soviets were in that earlier period, and we do uh, need to to ultimately find a way to work on global warming, which will uh, sink all of us literally uh, if we don't find a common solution. And, and pandemics are not going to go away, even if this one does. So uh, there is a global agenda that has to be pursued while sim simultaneously uh, we find ways to preserve our institutions that are so important to us. Uh, so I think that's the, that's the message of, of my book. I think uh, there's, there's a lot of, uh, 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 there's, a, there's actually a kind of uh, possibility for an optimistic uh, ending to this story, but but we're going to have to work hard and pull, pull, uh, roll up our sleeves if we're going to uh, move in that direction. So Ben, that's that's what I'll say for today, and look forward to questions and comments. Mm -hmm.